we will look at what I think if you're going to address a class on American political science, you simply cannot do it. Uh, and I don't want you walking out of here in a couple months as a person who's been through a course like this and not have understood the political implications of the U.S. Civil War. I mean, this, I mean, we're 150 years removed from the event and we kind of lose the, the significance of it. But it has huge political implications. Our country is not going, it was, the events of the Civil War and its, and its aftermath have forever changed the American political order and we still live in light of that today. So what I'd like to do today is look at the events of the Civil War historically somewhat, but more importantly politically. What were the political implications of the U.S. Civil War? Look at Lincoln and slavery. And that's going to give us some, uh, a fuller understanding of some of the, 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 the discussion we've had already about the nature of presidential or executive powers. Um, you're going to learn something, I think, that uh, if, if uh, the years have told me anything, you've walked in here with some incorrect information and you'll walk out with some better information today regarding what Lincoln did vis-a-vis -vis slavery. The next three weeks after that, our final sort of three weeks interacting like this before we move to a couple weeks of interacting differently in terms of your group projects and discovering what you all learned in your research, will be on the, th on the three main institutions of American government. I could have done that at the beginning of the class, but now you're now loaded with some categories to understand that discussion at a much higher degree. And again, as I probably said over and over again, the whole purpose of this course beyond the academics of it is to help you be better citizens, more informed citizens. I was listening on the way in um, today on the radio and a radio commentator was saying, uh, making note of a certain politician saying that this politician is playing to the most ignorant amongst us. In other words, his argument was that this noted politician was, was lying or being intentionally deceptive to us and that anybody who was reasonably informed would see right through it. My hope is that, that if there's a politician in our future that does those kind of things, that we would be the kind of people who'd say, that, that's not true. And I wouldn't want to base my sort of participatory decisions about how I would vote or who I would support in something or what I think is important within the American political order based upon deceptive arguments. And they're out there all the time. There's out there all the time, so we have to be aware of these things. Okay, uh, sorry about the uh, ink here, but hopefully you can see somewhat. I'll, I'll uh, repeat this if you can't see it. Uh, will that, does that help or hurt? That eh, sort of helps. Um, some key dates here, just to keep in mind, because you can't understand globally what we're going to be talking about today unless you understand a little bit of the pecking order. I, this isn't a U.S. history class. It's not important that you memorize dates per se for an exam or anything in this class. But again, part of the goal here is to become more educated. You ought to have a general sense as, a, as, a, as an increasingly educated person of general dates of things. So if you're talking to someone and you don't know that the U.S. Civil War was generally during the first five years of the, of the 1860s, welcome to that piece of knowledge. But here's some key dates that we'll, that we'll want to consider today. Like we do today, we elect a president in, in the first Tuesday of November. It's written into the Constitution that the general election, what we talked about last week, uh, yeah, last week, two weeks ago, happens on the first Tuesday of November every four years. And so in November 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected. Unlike Barack Obama, who took office two, three months later in January of 2009, Lincoln has to wait until March of 1861. So imagine being elected in November and taking office in March. They change, we've, we've made adjustments to the Constitution. That's a lot of time, particularly in the interim between Lincoln's election and when he actually is legally the president. Nine southern states announce that they're leaving the Union and all kinds of nasty stuff starts happening. Like, uh, can you imagine if you turned on CNN today and found out that nine states in the Union w announced that they were leaving us and were taking up arms in anticipation that we might try to bring them back? That's what Lincoln walks into. The president of the day during, these, the, during this interim period of time 
is always at the bottom of the list or near the bottom of the list when presidential rankings happen. So when people are asked or historians are asked who's the greatest president and who's the worst, this guy's always at the bottom. Any uh, clue of who that might be? James Buchanan, uh, a southerner, oddly enough, and uh, his view on what he could do about these nine southern states leaving was essentially, eh, I guess there's nothing we can do. And he was seen as a pretty uh, weak president in this regard and pretty unimportant in history. Uh, Lincoln is inaugurated in March of 1861, and you got to read this week one of the great inaugural addresses of history. This would have been one that people would have been sitting on the edge of their seat saying, what is this guy going to say? That, so it was a, it's one of the biggest of the biggies. It's, it's right up there with Washington's first inaugural address. It's right up there with FDR's first inaugural address in 1932. Uh, somewhat similarly, people were looking at Barack Obama's inaugural address that he gave, you know, four years ago almost now, and the country was in a period of crisis. People pay attention at these particular times. Probably like no other in history, though, in our history so far, people were paying attention to that address you read this week. So I'd like to look at some key aspects of that with you today. Um, when Lincoln takes office, there is no civil war going on officially, meaning organized armies are not fighting against each other like they would be very soon. That starts <coughs> one month later in April of 1861 when the Confederates in Charleston Harbor in South Carolina shell the snot out of a fort there called Sumter. Uh, has anybody been to Fort Sumter? I should get some pictures. No? Nobody been to Sumter? So if you ever get to Charleston, it's a, it's a quaint the old Charleston particularly is this quaint little town that you could just, it's like walking back into history. Uh, you can go to graveyards there, as I walked through a couple summers ago in Charleston with my son, and you can, go, you can see gravestones of people who signed the U.S. Constitution. Sort of flattens history a little bit, doesn't it? So you see these South Carolinians who are buried right there in Charleston Harbor uh, churches, and when the Confederates shelled this little man-made fort out in the middle of Charleston Harbor, the war was on. Interestingly enough, when you go out, you can take a little ferry ride out to this fort, which has been somewhat reconstructed. You, you can see a list of names of people who served in the, in the Federal Army who were on, in that, on that island, on that fort, that day that the Confederates, April 9th, 1861, shelled it. And I didn't know this until I actually went there and looked at the plaque. Abner Doubleday was there. Who's Abner Doubleday? No? Abner Doubleday? The inventor of baseball was on that, was in the federal military in the, in the American, United States Army in, in, in Fort Sumter, South Carolina when that shell when that fort was shelled. Amazingly, and if you look back at historical pictures that they took after this fort was shelled and eventually surrendered to the Confederates, it looks like a nuclear device went off. I mean, they shelled it for like 13 hours, and they had, they had months to train their artillery from about four different angles on this fort. So it was never in doubt that the Confederates could, could reduce that fort to rubble, but not one man was killed in it amazingly, until the official surrender ceremony in which the Confederates allowed the Union forces to lower the flag and have a ceremony and have a, you know, cannon salute to the flag and all that stuff. And one of the cannons misfired during that ceremony and killed a guy. So the, one of the ironies of, of history in that regard. So if you go to Fort Sumter, you, there's a little museum attached to it now, and you can actually see the flag that, that sailed over the fort um, that day. It's tattered, beat up, of course, as you might imagine. And it was the very same flag that after the Civil War was won, they made a point to go down there and run it up the flagpole again to sort of send a message that, you know, you guys, you, you Southerners have failed. So it's, it is key for you to see here that in March of 1861, there is no war. Now you have a war. <laughs> 
politically, that has huge implications because now Lincoln is acting like a wartime president and he's going to do some things between here and here that are very significant. Three big things of very big controversy, even in the day, that, that you'll want to make note of. The three things that Lincoln does on his own authority as executive, as, as the president, in the interim between now that the Civil War is going and he appears before Congress on July 4th. How about that great day, right? July 4th, 1861, and you got a chance to read that address. In the interim, he does three things. He suspends the writ of habeas corpus on his own authority. When he suspends the writ, it essentially means this. All the legal niceties that you might be due during normal civil times are no longer accorded you. So if you have the bad fortune of being arrested, say, you have the right to be char charged and know what you're being charged with. You have now a right to an attorney, you have a right to a jury trial. They just can't throw you in jail and throw away the key and say, we'll get to you when we want to get to you. When the writ of habeas corpus is suspended, they can do precisely that. So Lincoln does that. The second thing he does is he, by executive order, calls up and raises an army of 75,000 troops. The third thing he does is blockade the South, meaning he authorizes the Federal Navy to sail down to southern ports and control what comes in and out. And that would have been a very key thing to do because the southerners were going to use cotton to fund their war effort. By the way, an interesting little thing, if you go down and you take a tour of Fort Sumter or, or the surrounding area down there in Charleston, and I, and I take it, some of you guys were talking about Virginia earlier, I take it that if you go to certain areas of the South today, they still refer to the Confederacy as us, interestingly enough. So I'm taking this tour of a surrounding Fort to Sumter and this young man who, is, who had served time in the U.S. military, he was a, a veteran, but he had just gotten out of the U.S. military and he was giving us sort of the, uh, the docent talk about this particular fort which dated back to revolutionary days and he referred to the Southerners as we and us. And I, you know, I wasn't going to quibble with him any, but um, just interesting that 150 years later that that still takes place. Yeah? My history teacher had um, relatives that lived in the South, and they still fought the war in North Virginia. Yeah. Um, and they still yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I've heard it. I lived in Florida, which is sort of a mixture of Southern culture and Northeastern culture. It's very odd. but. Um, even, even some Southerners down there will refer to it as the late unpleasantness, <laughs> the war of Northern aggression. Yeah, interesting, interesting. If you're, if you're fascinated by this time period as I was, um, even as, uh, I, mean, I was like a geek, I read, I read this stuff on the bus on the way to high school, you know, everybody else was talking and I was pouring through books on the Civil War. One of the most fascinating books I ever read that's a serious work of political science um, that's a very readable book, it's a very thin book, it was, was entitled Why They Fought. And it was an analysis of letters from foot soldiers, not big generals and big, you know, guys with a bunch of stuff on their sleeves, but the average guy fighting in the trenches both for the North and the South, and they read their letters. And they did an analysis of trying to ask the question, what was the motivation for why these guys fought? So is you, now you haven't read this book, but if you were to hazard to guess, why did the Southerners fight? Why would the average guy, who may or may not have owned slaves, probably didn't. If you were an officer in the U.S. or in the Confederate military, you were probably a person of somewhat of importance or had some military training or some wealth. But if you were just the average foot soldier guy, you may have just been an average sort of Joe Farmer or whatever down south. What, why would you have fought? That one doesn't seem to be too striking. Why would you fight in the U.S. Civil War if you're a Southerner, just average guy? Take a guess. Actually, it's pretty obvious. Your way of life. Yeah, it's your way of life. You got these Yankee hordes coming down on your property. Not, not much uh, motivation uh, needed. 
to take up your gun and fight back the Yankee hordes. It was a way of life that the war of northern aggression, who do these Yankees think they are? They're coming down to invade, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back, no problem. What was interesting and what the Southerners oftentimes wrote in their letters is why don't these people just leave us alone? Right? I mean, particularly if you know anything about the U.S. Civil War, it didn't go well for the North for about the first two and a half years of a four-year war. I mean, it went pretty bad. I mean, you all heard of Gettysburg? Yeah? You heard of Antietam? These are, these are battles which took place in Maryland and Pennsylvania. That's northern territory. So the war was so bad for the North for the first two and a half years that Robert E. Lee's army of northern Virginia invaded the North. That's how bad the war was going for the first two and a half years. When they looked at Union soldiers, the average guy fighting for the Union Army of why they fought against the South, what was most striking about this book is it revealed that these men fought for abstract notions of union. They fought for the the, the thing that we have been talking about since the beginning of our class, the necessity of a strong, this, it's what Washington talked about in his farewell address, the necessity for a strong union for our political prosperity. These men were giving their lives for that abstract notion of the collective. I mean, pretty amazing that people would, would go, and we're talking about going to their death, we're talking about hundreds of thousands you know, don't, don't miss that fact. That's still the bloodiest thing that's ever happened in the United States. And one of the big reasons was, if you're, if you're interested in military stuff, is that the ballistics of the weapons of the day were better than the tactics. That's why the U.S. Civil War was so bloody. In, you ever wonder when you watch these Revolutionary War movies and they all just sort of line up and everybody just sort of takes, you know, shots at 100 yards at each other? You think, well, we, we think in terms of modern day warfare, if I had one AK-47, I could wipe out the entire line. Well, the ballistics of a Revolutionary War musket were somewhat sketchy at, at those distances, and so you weren't, it wasn't a sure kill. Well, the tactics leading into the Civil War had, had progressed beyond just sort of lining up and shooting at each other but the weapons were a whole lot better than that. I mean, they had ballistics and sharpshooters that, that could pick off people at, at, at long distances. Artillery was much better by this point. So that's why the carnage of the U.S. Civil War was so great. When northern newspapers and southern newspapers got glimpses of the photo, photos that were produced of the U.S. Civil War, it turned, it turned opinion in the north to against the war quite a bit. In fact, Lincoln was going to lose the election four years later in 1864. He won, but it looked like he was going to lose because the war was going so bad. Anyway, Okay, so what we'll want to look at, and what you've already got a first pass at now, is looking at some of the letters that Lincoln wrote, <coughs> some of the addresses that he gave. And there's a little bit of a, of, a, of a back and forth here that I want to revisit with you in this regard. Now, I believe I had you read some letters that Lincoln wrote as a rather obscure, unnotable congressman in the 1840s. And you probably read that and thinking, why in the world am I reading Abraham Lincoln from the 1840s? He served one term in the U.S. House of Representatives and then returned to private life and was a private citizen until 18, in the rough, roughly the 18, late 1850s when it looked like he, was, he ran for the Senate against Stephen Douglas and lost in 1858. So Lincoln, Lincoln um, had some prior service in the U.S. government and wrote some things here that I think would be of particular interest to us that I, that I want to look at here. Um, here's what we'll do, and I, th I suspect we've already started. I've given you some background reminding you of some events of the Civil War. We've understand some of the general events of the early chronology that's important for us politically. The U.S. Civil War doesn't end until April of 1865. 
so it's a pretty long and bloody struggle. What, what we're most interested in for the purposes of our class is looking at the, these events and their particular importance politically. And you live in light of the events of that day and what, what happened in that regard. Okay, so as I recall now, you got a chance to read Lincoln and he wrote a letter to his law partner in February of 1848. And what happened in the latter part of the 1840s that was a big, big event for the U.S. in the late 1840s? Any remembrance of that? If you don't, I'll give you some hints. We live today, or at least we reside currently, in a state of the union that uh, came here in 1850, right? That's when, the, that's when California became a state in 1850. California becoming a state was a result of a war in which the United States took some territory from another country. Is this hearkening any? No? Mexican the Mexican-American War, thank you very much. Lincoln is a congressman in, from Illinois during that, that conflict. And he's weighing in on something here in a letter back to his law partner, Illinois, talking about something. So if you have this letter that Lincoln writes to William Herndon in February 1st of 1848, now's a good time to sort of look at it with us. And he's talking about this vote this vote affirms that the war, uh, I'll uh, uh, acclimate you to the exact phrase here in a second. Congress declared war on Mexico back in the 1840s, and Lincoln got to cast a vote about whether he was, he was going to vote to declare war on Mexico as a congressman or not. He said no. So when Lincoln was asked to vote about whether the country should declare war on Mexico, his vote was no. And there was a reason why. Did anybody pick up why from your reading of this? Okay. All right, so let me acclimate you to something then here. Um, so he starts off here in very formal, uh, your letter of the 19th, Ultimo, was received last night and for which I'm obliged, blah, blah, blah. And he talks about Ashman's amendment, which is lost on you and me in history. But Ashman's amendment was the, the call for declaring war on, on Mexico. Um, and then there's a sentence that begins here. It's about uh, five, six lines down. That vote affirms that the war was un unnecessarily and unconstitutionally commenced by the president. Now, a little backdrop to help flesh that out for you. Does anybody know why the war between the United States and Mexico started? Anybody remember this from history or no? Like many wars, this war started over a dispute over territory. Texas was its own country for a while. Any Texans in here? Yeah? Yeah, there's a special breed down there, right? I, I'm particularly note, noting of a certain bumper sticker that I oftentimes see on Texas cars that says, there are two kinds of people in the world, Texans and those who wish they were. Remember, you've seen this bumper sticker? No, well, I was only born there. You were born there, so you haven't adopted this no. Texas swagger. Well, they've got a little <laughs> swagger going on down there in Texas because they can boast like no other state in the union that they were their own country for a while, that they fought a revolution as Texans against the Mexican government. Do you remember the Alamo, all that stuff? So Texas fought a, fought a war against Mexico successfully and wins, and they are declared their own country, but, but there's this lingering border dispute between Texas, which is now a state by 1840, and the Mexican government. Mexico thinks that the border is somewhat more north than the Rio Grande River, which is where the border now of Texas and Mexico is. So you've got this territory in between that's sort of like no man's land that the Mexicans claim and we claim it too. 
and what happens starting leading up to the to the war is that the Mexican military starts to mass right at the border of the Rio Grande River and it looks like they're coming into this territory and it's harder to move people out once they're in so President Polk sends the US military into this disputed territory and when the Mexicans see that it's go time and a war starts and then we have a declaration of war and we prosecute a pretty successful war we actually invade Mexico take their capital and they sue for peace and as a as a part of the peace deal we get New Mexico Arizona Nevada California you know pretty significant swaths of land right Lincoln thinks that war was unconstitutionally commenced because he doesn't think that the president has the ability and this is key the pre he doesn't think that the president has the ability to initiate hostilities so his constitutional view of article 2 is that the is that the US president does not possess the power to initiate hostilities with foreign countries and so he thinks that Polk the president of the day in sending US troops into that disputed area was constitutional he thought that that Polk provoked a fight with the Mexicans and so we had no constitutional authority to declare war on Mexico at this time you'll note later on down the page that he says uh, once the war was on he did vote for supplies that is a that has a long history in in the United States and I'm grateful for it particularly if I was in the military can you imagine being sent to a war zone and Congress not voting to fund the war effort even if Congress was against the war effort they fund it and that's of recent vintage here even with us there's a lot of Democrats in Congress during the early part of this this past decade who did not like the war in Iraq or Afghanistan but they still voted for supplies for the troops and we ought to be grateful at least for that you know in that regard okay so that's what it is now now Lincoln follows up his letter here on February 15th and he writes he writes uh, Mr. Herndon again so if you have that in front of you let's turn to that not sure what I have here um, we're gonna look at three big issues today and we're looking at this one during the first half of class we'll look at this one in the second half of class and then we will look at this particularly when we get to the courts so sorry I've, uh, I've fallen behind in my duties of flipping slides for you so let me reacclimate us at this point we're looking at Lincoln and his thoughts as a congressman about the ability the constitutional authority of the president to initiate hostilities and he thinks that the president does not have that authority now why would we care what an obscure congressman from Illinois has to say about the nature of executive power in 1848 because that same obscure congressman from Illinois 13 years later will be the president of the United States and you and I will investigate whether Lincoln is consistent with his view from the 1840s and you'll see that he is that's the point of walking through this a little bit with you so he writes a follow-up letter to his law partner William Herndon on February 15th 1848 and about the third line down he says this let me state what I understand to be your position it is that if it shall become necessary to repel an invasion the president may without violating the Constitution cross the line and invade the territory of another country and that whether such necessity exists in any case the president is to be the sole judge so he's saying to his law partner let me make sure I understand your argument here Mr. Herndon is your argument that the president has the discretion and the sole discretion to determine whether there might be some imminent invasion of the country and if so he can act and repel the invasion before it begins and at that point Herndon probably would have said yeah that's exactly what I'm arguing Lincoln does not buy this but going further consider whether this is or is not your position if it is it's a position that neither the president himself nor any friend of his as far as I know has ever taken
their only positions are first that the soil was ours where hostility was commenced and second that whether it was rightfully ours or not Congress had annexed it and the president for that reason was bound to defend it both in which we are clearly proved to be false in fact and blah 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 that soil wasn't ours and Congress didn't annex it and so Lincoln comes down to the view that the president has initiated hostility allow the president he says to invade a neighboring nation whenever he shall deem it necessary to repel an invasion and you allow him to do so whenever he may choose to say he deems it necessary for such a purpose and you allow him to make war at his pleasure now all that is just pretty fancy jargon that he's writing back to his law partner arguing that President Polk does not have the power to initiate wars he thinks that our Constitution be, should be understood that the president does not have the uh, positive authority to initiate hostilities with foreign entities. Now, how many times do you think the U.S. military has been involved over 235 some odd years of U.S. history? Take a wild guess. I don't know the exact number. maybe three or four times maybe a little higher I'm trying to engender a guess from somebody who's bold take a guess Daniel. 20 maybe a little higher than that you might multiply that by 10 <laughs> yeah we've been engaged in 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 a number of hostilities 20 maybe is a is the biggest of the biggies right world war II, the korean conflict vietnam and when you start adding those up you get around you know teens twenties that kind of thing but think of all the the these minor incursions some of which you've never even heard of right how many of you seen act of valor yeah i'm i went and saw that with a with a friend of mine and i want my son to see it. that's if you've not seen act of valor you need to see that it's it's quite bloody uh, somewhat uh, not too bad not too bad but that's reality that's what's on the plate of president obama today that those kind of scenarios and there's all kinds of military activity taking place around the world like that on a daily basis i suspect the point is this that if you look at the 200 some odd notable engagements of the US military most all of them have been initiated by the American president so Lincoln's view here is in the minority that the president doesn't have the power to initiate hostilities the biggest example of the president initiating hostilities without Congress so much as ever weighing in was the Korean War Truman on his own authority committed hundreds of thousands of American troops to that conflict it's not technically a war because Congress never declared it and there was never kind of any authorization for it so Lincoln's view here that the president doesn't have the power to initiate hostilities is a is a minority view what will be interesting for us is to see if whether he's consistent with this view as the president himself that's why we're reading this here okay so when we look at Lincoln leading up to his presidency here, we're, we're interested in seeing, first of all, whether he's consistent with his views from the 1840s, but that's going to review, that's going to reveal that his views on the Constitution in general, and more importantly for our purposes, what he thinks about the nature of executive power. And you'll actually be able to understand his verbiage on this because of what you understand from the Pacificus Helvidius debate. It's one of the reasons why I had you read that early on, because it has huge importance today as we're talking about this, but it has implications about Barack Obama today. That's how significant that debate was, because it raised issues that we're still dealing with today, and you, as a hopefully more informed citizen now, can assess Barack Obama's actions or whatever future president's actions in that in in a, in a light of a of a 
more fine-tuned radar, we'll say, and you've got categories from which to think about these things. Okay, so that's really our project here. And, and oh, I forgot how many slides I have. And there's no reason to write this down, but this is just sort of, um, this is sort of where we're headed here. You know, this is, this is sort of the chronology history of it. You know, Texas becomes its own state here. The U.S. says, hey, we'd like to have Texas as a state, and they agree. And then we've got uh, a conflict with the Mexicans that, that Lincoln is writing within at this point. And this is really the questions that we've been addressing at this point. Okay. So is there any question about Lincoln vis-a-vis -vis the, the executive power of initiating hostilities at this point in the 1840s? Pretty, he's pretty clear on this point. The president doesn't have that discretionary power. Okay. Then he writes, then he writes this letter that we just we just referenced again, and his thoughts were that it's never proper for the president to initiate hostilities. If there was ever a president in U.S. history who, who may have made a good argument that you could initiate hostilities, it may be President Abraham Lincoln, given the fact that nine southern states, when he takes office, had, had in their view, legally left the Union. They declared ordinances of secession, their people voted on it, they had big rallies and parades celebrating the fact that they were no longer now part of the United States. If anybody could make an argument that, that the President of the United States could initiate some kind of conflict, Lincoln may have been that President, but as you'll see, he doesn't do it. Okay. So now we're in a position to look at Lincoln's first inaugural address. And I want, I want to read some key aspects of that with you in light of what we've just discovered here. So tell me, as you had a chance to read it here over this past week, what are some things you noticed? This was one of the biggest of the biggies, friends. This was, everybody was on the edge of their seat. Um, you can Google around and you can actually see photos of Lincoln giving this address. They're pretty grainy and they're pretty much at a distance, but you can see that old black top hat sort of uh, above, the, above the crowd there. You can actually go to the U.S. Capitol today and stand essentially where Abraham Lincoln would have stood to give that address. That's the kind of fun stuff I like to do. I like to go and see an old photo of where some historic figure stood. That's why I want to go to Israel someday. How many of you been to yeah, I think that would be amazing to just walk those same roads that Jesus may have walked. Okay, so comments. What, what, what did you see from Lincoln's first inaugural address that was notable for you? Minna. Okay. That's going to be very key because he gives no credence to these acts that the Southerners have done, these, these nine Southern states seceding from the Union. He gives no legal credence to that. So we'll want to look at that. Anything else? Now, I'm not big on sort of lecturing like your father, but if you didn't do as well on that exam as you wanted to, one of the indications and one of the expectations are that you're engaging this stuff and if and 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 the the exams and the assignments are written assuming a a fair measured engagement of these things so if you're struggling my my biggest admonition for you is dive in and read this stuff because i'm assuming coming in that i can't say everything about everything and so i'm assuming you're coming in here somewhat loaded for this regard so any, any other comments about what you saw with Lincoln here in this address? Please. He refers to the people as, like, friends. Yes. Some of the, uh, so at the very end, isn't it, if you're, if, you're, if you're thinking what I'm thinking of, Lincoln um, has some, if, if I could go back in a time machine, get in my DeLorean with the flux capacitor and the whole deal, and I could go back and watch maybe one or two speeches in U.S. political history, this would have been one I would have wanted to see and see that verbiage come across his lips. 
Mm. Interesting. So he's going to make some, some interesting constitutional arguments here. In other words, Lincoln, in a certain sense, sees his hands tied. Now that he is officially the president, his hands are tied that he must act in certain ways because the people, via the Constitution, have empowered him and it constrains him to act in a certain way. Does it constrain him to launch an immediate invasion of the South? Not so much. Okay. Well, let's visit a few things here. So if you have this address in front of you, let's visit a few um, key elements here that I think you'll find interesting. Um, let me just refer you just by, just to, to make a note. We'll look at this during the second half of class. Look at the top of page 54. And he, right out of the box, addresses the issue that everybody wants to know what this new president is going to say about slavery. And he says, he's, and he's quoting from a prior speech here at the top of 54, he says, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so and I have no inclination to do so. This, you would think, would make the Southerners deliriously happy. What have we done? We've seceded from the Union here and the President of the United States, who we feared so much, has just announced that he's not going to do about anything about slavery where it exists. He's not coming down to take away our slavery here in Alabama and Georgia. Any clue about why this wouldn't have made the Southerners happy? We'll talk about it in the second half of class, okay? Um, then on the bottom of page 55, he starts talking about the nature of the Union. Is that, yes, here it is. He starts talking about the nature of the Union. And he's talking about the fact that the Union, here in the second, uh, that last full paragraph on page 55, he says, I hold that in contemplation of, of universal law in the Constitution, that the Union of these states is perpetual. What do you think he means by that? What is he, he is announcing here in a, in a famous speech that in his view, the Union is perpetual. What does perpetual mean? Yes, despite the fact that nine southern states have announced that the Union is over, his view is that it's perpetual. Why do you think he would think it's perpetual? This, this you do know the answer to because we talked about this back when we talked about the formation of the Constitution and the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. Yes, when the, his view is the Federalist view vis-a-vis -vis the Anti-Federalist. So Lincoln is speaking right down the middle of the fairway in terms of a Federalist view of the understanding of the Constitution. The Constitution did not establish what the Articles of Confederation established, says Lincoln. It didn't establish this compact of states where you have 13 little semi-sovereign entities, you recall this, that sort of had these league of friendship with one another. The argument, and he will refer to it here, I believe. Yes, he refers to it on the next page. He refers back to the preamble to the Constitution, and he says, what was the very purpose of the Constitution? And the preamble announces it. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, walk away from the Articles of Confederation and establish a new constitution. And that new constitution is one in which these union now of states is like, and I, if you recall, I, I alluded you to Genesis and the teaching there on the nature of marriage, the two becoming one flesh, that's perpetual. If I walked in here this morning and said, my wife and I are having some serious difficulties and I'm thinking about walking away, you might say to me, in good pastoral advice to me, now wait a minute, I thought you understood that your marriage was perpetual. You don't walk away from it. That's essentially what Lincoln is announcing to the Southerners. 
uh, my disgruntled bride, my disgruntled brethren, and, and to your point about what he says at the end of the speech, you don't walk away from this thing. You gotta work it out. And we will work it out. And I'm not going to provoke you, is what he's going to announce, okay? So, so, so he gives us here in, the, in, the, in these verbiage sort of the Federalist understanding of the nature of the Union. If the United States be not a government proper, but an association of states in the nature of a contract, that's the compact of states theory, <coughs> and it can be peaceably unmade by less than the parties who made it, one party to a contract may violate, break, so to speak, but not require it to lawfully rescind it. Descending from these general principles, we find the proposition that in legal contemplation, the Union, says Lincoln, is perpetual, confirmed by the history of the Union itself. The Union is actually much older than the Constitution. It was formed by the Articles of Association, the Declaration, blah, blah, blah. It was further matured in the faith of the thir th then 13 states expressly plighted and engaged, it should be perpetual by the Articles, and finally in 1787, one of the declared objects for ordaining and establishing the Constitution was to form a more perfect Union. But if the destruction of the Union by one or only a part of the states be lawfully possible, then the Union is less perfect than it was before the Constitution, having lost the vital element of perpetuity. So, he, so he's starting off by saying, let's make sure we understand each other. I am operating as the President of the United States now, as I have just taken the oath of office, and that's what happens after you take the oath of office. You, get, you, you stand up to a podium and you give a speech. So he is now speaking as President of the United States, and he's saying, my view of the deal is that despite what the Southerners have done in these nine states, the Union has not been broken. It is still perpetual, and I will act as such. But he says here at the bottom of the page, after he says, look, I don't recognize the legality of your secession, he says, in doing this, there need be no bloodshed or violence, and there shall be none unless it is forced upon the national authority. That's a, that's a key sentence here. Why would I have, why would I want to take special note of that sentence? Why would I, why would I take note of Abraham Lincoln saying, that there shall be no bloodshed or violence unless it is forced upon the national authority. Why am I paying special attention to that now? <coughs> that's, the, that's the whole point of why I had you go back to 1848 so you'd understand that sentence. Lincoln is saying, look, I'm not initiating hostilities with you unless you force it. And I'll hearken you back to April of 1861 in Fort Sumter now the issue is being forced upon him. That changes the whole deal. No longer would Lincoln be acting in an initiative sense, he'd be acting like a responder. And he responds by calling up the military of the United States. But he announces further down in the paragraph that there's not going to be any invasion, and there will be no attempt to, uh, to, to do these things. He says that while I may possess the legal right to take back federal property, it would be perceived by the Southerners as an act of invasion. So what had happened in these nine states is that federal property was seized by the Southerners, and not insignificant federal property, not just post offices and federal buildings and stuff like that, federal arsenals, guns, federal naval yards, boats, ships, these kinds of things, Southerners seceded and they took the federal goodies that were in the state. Lincoln says that I have the legal right to take that back, but that would be perceived as an invasion, initiating hostilities, and so I will refrain. Now he doesn't have to refrain long because the Southerners shell Fort Sumter uh, a month later, and now all this goes away. He's not, he's responding. Okay, let's see what we can accomplish here. Um, ah, here's a key section. Look at page 58. I'll sit for sake of my old body. Look at page 58. And here he talks about that if the union is perpetual, that the union's not broken, what is secession? From questions, as a top of page 58, from questions of this class, <coughs> 
spring our constitutional controversies and we divide amongst them into majorities and minorities. If the minority will not acquiesce, the majority must or the government will cease. There's no other alternative for continuing the government is acquiescence on one side or another. So when we vote on things, some people get outvoted and that's called the minority. Some people are in the majority. So the question is, who submits? Well, we, most of the time we think about a minority submitting to the, to the will of a majority, right? I mean, you may have been a Republican back in 2008 and didn't like it that a Democrat, Barack Obama, won the presidency and you're in the minority, but you submit still. He's, he has legitimacy and authority and all that, right? So Lincoln says, look, when, when, when you have a vote on things, you have a majority and a minority. In a democracy, the minority submits. A majority could submit, but that seems outrageous, right? That a majority would submit to minority. If a minority in such a case would secede or leave the union rather than submit or acquiesce, they make a precedent which in turn will divide and ruin them. For a minority of their own will secede from them when a majority refuses to be controlled by such a minority. For instance, why may not any portion of a new confederate, well he just says that could happen again. Next paragraph. If there is such a perfect identity of interest among the states to compose a new union as to produce harmony only or, and prevent renewed secession, plainly the central idea of secession is anarchy. Key theme for you to see here. That if a minority will not submit to a majority rule, it's anarchy. What's anarchy? Sorry? Chaos and lawlessness. Lawlessness, which leads to chaos. What Lincoln is saying is here, we are a government, we are an entity governed by the rule of law, and the rule of law says that the minority, if you get outvoted, you still submit to the majority rule. If you don't, the very rule of law breaks down and you have anarchy. So this is an announcement to the Southerners that their acts of secession is tantamount to anarchy. And that's not going to sit well over the Southerners over their morning coffee as they read this the next day in the newspaper. Got it? Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, maybe one more thing here. Uh, let's see what we haven't addressed. Um, let me save this comment on this when we talk about slavery here in the second half of class. Um, we're still we're going to look at the nature of Lincoln's thoughts on the initiation of hostilities. To a certain extent, this speech was meant to be conciliatory. It was meant to announce to the Southerners, extend an olive branch. You know what it means to extend an olive branch? It means to peace, to say, I don't want conflict here, right? So when you're married someday, you'll think of you'll think of things to do with your husband, ladies, or your wives, you few gentlemen, sir, um, where you'll extend an olive branch. You'll have some issue, some discussion that'll come up. Ladies, you'll usually be wrong. I thought that might get your attention. I gotta wake you up a little bit. Nevertheless. If you're the offending party, particularly if, if God's spirit is speaking to you and he's saying, uh, get over your pride and suck it up and go to your wife or go to your husband and say, I think I may be wrong here. Um, you will extend an olive branch and do something. Bring her some pearls. There she is, there, bring her some pearls, men. That would be a good olive branch if she likes that kind of jewelry, right? Um, by the way, as a parenthesis, some of the best advice I ever got from an older guy about raising your kids, and think about this in relation to your father or your mother, particularly your father. I asked this guy one time, whose kids were all walking with the Lord, I said, what if, is there, is there some things that you might offer me? And I was a young father at that point, I, my son was just, you know, crawling around the floor. And I said, what? advice would you give me that would be central to helping your kids develop and develop things in their 
walk with God where they would continue to walk with Christ for the long term, he said, that's easy. Admit to your kids when you've been wrong. And I thought, oh, okay, why is that so significant? And I asked him and he said, it's significant, particularly if you're very vocal about your faith and you're very, if, if, particularly if you have any kind of role in a church where you're saying the right things, right? You're, you're, you may be admonishing people to be of this sort or to be a Christ follower or whatever, you know, you, you speak at a chapel. The problem is that when you see somebody speak in chapel, you don't know what their real life is like. Your kids know what your real life is like because you live with them in, your, in their house, right? And so they see that there are times when you don't live up to your own admonitions right? And so you're, if you never admit that you're wrong, then your kids sense hypocrisy and they sense uh, dissonance, I guess that would be a way to put it. Uh, Dad talks the talk, but I'm not seeing him walk the walk here. I had an opportunity pretty early on in, when, when Jacob got old enough to where I sense God's spirit speaking to me and I, and I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test what this guy told me. And so Jacob was old enough, and he was in his bed, and we, he did something, and he did something inappropriate. He's a little crumb cruncher, whatever he was doing. He did something, and, and I got angry with him, and we sent him to bed, and he was up there in bed, you know, sniveling and just trying to get himself to sleep. And I came, and I knelt down by his bedside, and he was old enough to sort of get this at that point, and I said, honey, daddy was wrong. I'm so sorry. I, I overreacted. And it was like a curtain came back. And, he, and, and there was reconciliation not only between us, but something fundamentally different sort of clicked in his little young mind. And I discovered that, that this guy who had spoken to me about that was right. And so I've always taken that into account where the kids sometimes will even initiate with me, Dad, I, I think you may have overreacted in that a little bit. And you have to, you have to be of the sort where you, where you can say, I think you might be right about that. And that, of all the things that I've seen with my kids who are, are serious in, in their development of their walk with Christ today, I, I'm here to tell you that that's true. So think about that in terms of your future parenting, but in terms of maybe what you wrestle with um, with your own parents if you struggle in, in that regard. Okay, last thing and we'll take a break. Um, Let's look at some of the most famous words that Lincoln had here. This is his olive branch, his, his ultimate. These are the words that I want to go back and see Abraham Lincoln say. These are some of the most famous, uh, wonderfully poetic prose in all of U.S. American history here on page 61. And Lincoln is announcing that I will not initiate hostilities with you while I have a legal right to take back what you've taken. I won't even go that far because I know you'd perceive it. And so he announces to the Southerners that if there's going to be a civil war, it's in their hands to determine whether that's going to be the case. One month later, they serve it up. In your hands, top of page 61, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. This government will not assail you. You have no conflict without you yourselves being the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government. That's, a, that's an allusion to John Locke's second treatise on government, if you're familiar with it. While I have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it, I am disinclined, loath, to close, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. Here it is. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched as surely as it will be by the better angels of our nature. Oh, what wonderful prose, right? This was back in the day and age where presidents wrote their own stuff, um, mostly, 
this has Lincoln's hand all over it. They got they, they shopped these phrases and stuff even back then. There there were there were people who helped them with speeches. Lincoln was notable, as you may recall, the Gettysburg Address, right? Sort of scratched it out, in, in on his way up to Pennsylvania. Those are some of the most famous words that Lincoln had, and and those words harken back to Washington and all this stuff. And he's trying to remind the Southerners of our history, our kinsmanship with each other, and we don't have to go down line in this Civil War. Unfortunately, it does happen a month later. Lincoln has to respond to it, so we'll start here in 10, 12 minutes or so, looking at Lincoln on, on this issue of responding to the Southerners, and he, and he speaks to Congress in July. Uh, any questions about what we've seen so far? We've seen Lincoln in the 1840s. We've seen that his his thoughts on executive initiatives of hostilities was such, and he was consistent with this, though he had uh, a lot of good reasons to maybe initiate hostilities with Southerners. Uh, you know, if you hold the view that the Union is perpetual and that it's unbroken, uh, to simply execute the laws in the Southern states mm, may have been viewed as initiating hostilities, and he chose to refrain uh, and didn't do it. Didn't have to refrain for long, because one month later, Fort Sumter is shelled, and now we have a war on. And the interesting thing for Lincoln is that now that when you have a war on, enemy territory is within, within binocular view of the White House. If you've been to Washington, D.C., and know where Arlington National Cemetery is, anybody sort of had that experience? You could ride the metro from the, from the uh, White House sort of metro stop to Arlington National Cemetery in what, 15 minutes? That's the distance between the White House and where Southern troops would have been active. Arlington, Virginia was enemy territory at this point. That's the crisis Lincoln has to deal with. And he does three big things again. He suspends the writ of habeas corpus. He calls up 75,000 troops to defend the Capitol and eventually put down the rebellion and he raises a, a navy, in a sense, to blockade southern ports. Those three things are potentially problematic in terms of an executive doing them because all three of those things fall under Article I powers. Congress has the power to raise armies and navies. And Congress, or at least the power to suspend the writ of habeas corpus, exists within Article I. All three of those things Lincoln does as an executive. So here's our question. Did Lincoln act unconstitutionally? Did he do something like Jefferson did with this uh, Lockean prerogative thing, if you recall that? Lockean prerogative is a, is a kind of power that the executive usually has to act when times call for it, and you go outside the law to do it. Did Lincoln? act like this. His argument was no. That everything he did between March, I'm sorry, April and July was constitutional. Now we get to discover how he argues that. Okay? And that's the that's the famous July 4th address. I was already there. Okay. So Lincoln is going to make an argument that constitutionally justifies all of his actions. Is it getting cold? Why don't you jack that up a little bit, Eddie? Is it, if it's cold, just start hitting the up button. See, if you wore this shirt, you'd be just so, your blood pressure would just be so, can't wait to get going. You'd be in here fanning yourself. You'd be so warm. All right. I get to, I get to miss the game tonight. Stink. But anyway. Um, this will be a key point. What did he think the central question was? As he stood before Congress in July of 1861, he says, there's a central question that I pose to you, my friends, whatever senators and congressmen were left, right? Because half of them went to be with the South. He says, there's a central question that we need to ask ourselves in consideration of what I've done in terms of whether it was constitutional or not. And then Lincoln asked this question, does he see himself having any choice? Was he constrained now to, to respond to the Southern aggression? And he asked Congress to do something, and he'll reiterate some things about Congress. So if you have, 
his July 4th address. Let's turn to it and look at some key aspects of it. Oh, yes, and by the way, if you're in D.C. next time and you're looking for a really uh, interesting tourist stop that's sort of one of the unknown ones or little known, Lincoln, during the Civil War, did not spend many summer evenings actually sleeping in the White House, and neither did his family. Uh, Washington, D.C. sits in a low spot. It's uh, drained swampland. Uh, if you wanted to get cool in those days before air conditioning, you needed to get out of the swampland and go up to the surrounding area around Washington where it was higher ground and you might get some breeze at night. That's where Lincoln uh, slept uh, and, and stayed, essentially, his family during the summer. So there's this place on the outskirts of Washington called the Soldier's Home, and you can go there. It's not in a very good area of town, so if you go, be prepared to sort of, you know, go in company. But it's a, it's a place that's still in existence, and you can buy this book there. This is where I uh, saw this book and bought it there. It's a collection of Lincoln's great speeches and they have a bookstore and stuff. And it's a really fascinating historical tour. You can go in the bedroom where Lincoln would have slept, and here's the bed he was in, and, and all that stuff. That was about a three-mile ride from the White House. Um, Lincoln attempted assassinations on Lincoln's life. There was at least three known attempts on his life on that he'd ride alone. Can you imagine if Barack Obama got on a horse and just started trotting out of the White House, and he did it on a regular basis? John Wilkes Booth originally meant to kidnap Lincoln on that journey between the White House and this soldier's home. They were going to kidnap him and hold him for ransom and use him as uh, leverage to sue for peace and that whole scene with the South. So anyway, just a lost known, little known fact on history. Okay, so Lincoln chooses July 4th of 1861 and he gives this very famous address to Congress. The first half of it is simply, hey, in case you've been sleeping the last three or four months, here's what's been going on. These nasty Southerners have done all kinds of nasties, and I've had to respond to it. Now, you may not know this, but the, but, but the Congress is not always in session, meaning they're not physically in Washington for, even today, large parts of the year. In March and, and April of 1861, Congress was not in session. The president has the power to call Congress back into session at any time. It's in his powers that if he needs Congress to do something or act on something, he at any time can call them back into session and could have done it at any time between April and July of 1861, but he doesn't. He leaves them out of session. Why would you think a president of the United States would leave Congress out of session, particularly at this time? It gets to the nature of the difference between Congress and a president. Yeah, Jennifer? Well, Congress, in order to make decisions, it takes a long time. Yes. Right. Good. You'll, that's exactly right. You're going to read one of the key Federalist papers on the presidency later in the semester of Federalist 70, and part of the argument there is that one of the virtues of having a single executive is that this person can act and act quickly, and they don't need to deliberate things. Congress, by its very nature, deliberates and talks about things. Holy cow, the Confederates are right over there. There's no time for deliberation. That's why he leaves Congress out of session. Finally, on a notable date in, in July, he calls them back into session, and essentially what he's asking them to do is, after the fact, constitutionally bless everything he's done. And they do. You didn't get to read that. I could have given you their little announcement to the president that, Abe, upon consideration of everything you've done over the past four months, we think everything you've done is wonderful, and we would have done the same thing if we'd have been around. But Lincoln intentionally leaves them out of the mix so that he can ramp the country up to a war footing quicker than talking about it, right? You can imagine how long it would have taken to yak it up. Here's a more contemporary example. It's early, it's early in the 1950s. 
and Harry Truman is sitting at his desk thinking about what he's going to have for lunch, and the phone rings, and it's somebody in South Korea, and they said the North Koreans are pouring over the border, and what do we do? Harry could have picked up the phone and said, well, I don't know, I'll have to wait till Congress sort of weighs in on this, and they're going to have a two-week debate on, the, on what we ought to do about this. That would have been very bad for South Korea. Truman picked up the phone, called the military people, and said, move. That's how a president acts. This is how Lincoln is acting right now. This is how Barack Obama will act now. Deliberation sometimes happens after the fact when times call for it. And, and we ought to ask whether we celebrate that. You may, you may not like the current president who's in there now, but you're glad that he or she's acting maybe in a responsible way. So again, sharpen your, your radar a little bit here. Okay, so Lincoln spends the first half of this speech um, talking about all the, all the uh, things that have happened and all the things that he's done. And here on page 65, addressing this issue right here, he says, look, at the end of the day, I'm going to ask you guys to bless everything I've done, and, and I'm going to make an argument that everything I did was constitutional, but this is the central issue that we need to ask ourselves here. Here at the bottom of page 65, he says, and this issue embraces more than the fate of the United States. It presents to the whole family of man the question of whether a constitutional republic or a democracy, a government of the people by the same people, can or cannot maintain its territorial integrity against domestic foes. That's the giant issue that we have to think about. No problem if you're talking about Britain invading or us follow, fighting against the Me Mexicans. The big issue now is can we continue to act in a constitutional manner when the people we're fighting are in-house? That's the central issue that Lincoln says we need to address. That's what makes the Civil War, isn't it? The most unique event in all of U.S. political history because you've got crisis, necessity, you've got constitutional issues coming up, and they come up at a time where you could not safely pass from the White House to Arlington, Virginia. That's what Lincoln had to deal with. Okay, so that, that's what he thinks is the central issue here. And he, here at the bottom of page 67, or, or back, back page, page, uh, page 66, he says, so viewing this issue, sec first full paragraph, no choice was left but to call out the war power of the government, and so to resist force employed for its destruction by force for its preservation. So Lincoln's saying, look, my hand is now forced, the Southerners, bombarded Fort Sumter, that starts it all. As soon as Lincoln calls up 75,000 troops, four or five more southern Confederate states immediately leave the Union, Virginia being the most notable one. Did you know the name Robert E. Lee? Yeah, is that somewhat of a familiar name? Southerner, big southern general. Lincoln personally asked Robert E. Lee to lead the Union forces in putting down the rebellion. Huh? He said no, of course, and took up arms against Lincoln as a Southerner. Such was, the, such was the tie that people had with their states at the time. Now, we think fondly of California, right? And I think fondly of Missouri. But in some sense, we have lost, or at least in large parts of this country, the idea that our state is more foundational and primary than the United States in general. Robert E. Lee thought that his, he could never draw his sword against his own state, and so if his state cast their, cast their lot with the Confederacy, so would he. So Lincoln says, I don't have a choice, and he suspends the writ of habeas corpus here at the bottom of page 67. Soon after the first call for militia was considered the duty to authorize the commanding general in proper cases according to his discretion, to suspend the writ of habeas corpus and to arrest, detain, without resort to the ordinary processes and forms of law. So here's how it would come down. If Lincoln invested in the military the power 
to where you're a military general and you're commanding some uh, sector of Maryland and you suspect that there might be a guy leading a band of Marylanders blowing up railroad bridges and doing other kinds of nasty little acts like that, that you could haul that guy out of bed in, in the middle of the night, throw him in a, f in, a f in a jail, a brig, and just say, you're done, bud. You're sitting this one out. That's exactly what happened. And many of these people start to sue and say, you can't do that. The president has no authority to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. So there's a real life court case that deals with this. Interestingly enough, the court rules against Lincoln. They said, Abe, you don't have the power to do this. Only Congress can suspend the writ of habeas corpus, not you. Now you've got a constitutional crisis. You've got the sitting Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court in 1862, one, 61, announced to the President and all interested parties that the President doesn't have this authority and that he must release the prisoner in question here, a guy named John Merriman. What do you think Lincoln does? It's like little history quizzes, isn't it? What do you, what do you think old Abe does? He ignores it. So let's say that the Supreme Court in June announces that Obamacare is unconstitutional. What would you say if Obama stood before a podium and said, I don't care what they say. You got a constitutional crisis on your hands, don't you? The, the, the Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court in 1861 ordered a local sheriff to show up to the federal fort where this guy was being held with, an, with a judicial order saying, I'm here for Mr. Merriman, he's to come with me. And he knocked on the door of a federal fort. The crisis came down to the point where the guys with the bigger guns won, right? So you're a local sheriff and you show up with a little 45 in your holster and you're, you're addressing a fort with cannons and a bunch of guys with guns, you lose. The president wins. Uh, why do I raise this issue? Because yesterday, Barack Obama stood at a podium. Did anybody see this? I'm, I'm here to be your, your messenger of contemporary political events and show you that the same issues that came up 150 years ago are coming up again. Granted, not with the same sense of crisis, civil war. Barack Obama stood at a podium yesterday or the day before and essentially said, that the Supreme Court does not have the power to overturn Obamacare. Did anybody sort of catch a drift of that? They, he said that a bunch of unelected judges do not possess the power to overturn or declare unconstitutional a duly enacted piece of legislation that was passed by Congress and signed by the President. In so doing, Barack Obama has announced that he stands in, in, in a different view that goes back to what you will discover here in about three weeks of the power of judicial review. It was established very early on in the history of our country, in 1803 to be exact, that the federal court has the power to overturn any law that it deems to be in disagreement with the Constitution. It's called judicial review. Barack Obama, a former constitutional law professor, announced that. The federal Fifth Circuit, this is like political theater playing out. You really ought to tune in. You guys are missing out on, I mean, forget about American Idol and all this stuff. This stuff's really like political theater. The Fifth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals yesterday, one of the people, one of the lawyers from the Justice Department was arguing a case that had some, something to do with Obamacare, it was a small provision of it, interrupted the federal attorney there and said, ma'am, I'm giving you a homework assignment. Check this out. I mean, you can, you, can, you can hear the audio of this. This woman in federal court yesterday, a, a government attorney, was given a homework assignment, no less than three pages, single spaced. Right? I mean, it was like being in class. It would be like, okay, 
you guys are really uh, not cutting the mustard here. I'm giving you a homework assignment for next week. I'd like you to give me, in a minimum of three pages, single spaced, what exactly is the position of the administration about the nature of federal judicial power? You take, he, he essentially said, ma'am, I want you to go to the Attorney General of the United States. I want you to consult and reference the words of the President on Monday. And I want you to, to announce for us the executive's view about the nature of federal judicial power. <laughs> I was thinking initially that the president, like Lincoln, would ignore this and say, away with me, you, you minor person, right? Lincoln did ignore the, the order of the court. But I heard today driving in that the attorney general of the United States said, oh, of course, our homework will be in. They gave him two days to do it. So we'll know by tomorrow what the opinion of the, of the federal government, the executive is on this issue. This is constitutional theater playing out right in front of us here, interestingly enough. Here's my prediction. I'd be willing to bet a lot of money on this. By the time we get in here next week and you ask me about this, because if you don't pay, if you don't tune in, you'll, you'll sort of miss this. My prediction is the executive will cave on this that they will say, oh, yes, of course, we do recognize the authority of the federal court, and maybe we were a bit too brash or we were misunderstood or whatever. But they'll cave on this because they stand, in, they stand in a, on a pretty thin constitutional ground in this sense. So anyway, okay. So Lincoln suspends the writ of habeas corpus and, and does all this and makes some interesting arguments here. Let's make sure we touch on this point. Does he think he has any choice? No. What does he think is a central issue? How do, now, the big issue is, how does he justify all of his actions? Let me look for the most salient portion here. Um, look on page 68. He is a sent now there's some fancy language here, so don't get caught, you know, mystified by the fancy language. But he's arguing that everything he did, which at first blush seems unconstitutional, is constitutional. Here at the top of 68. Nevertheless, the legality and propriety of what he had done are brought into question. And the attention of the country has called into the proposition that one who was sworn to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. That's out of Article 2 should not himself violate them. In other words, uh, I know that there are people out there arguing that the person who's supposed to faithfully execute the laws is breaking them. Of course, some consideration was given to the questions of power and propriety before the matter was acted upon. The whole of the laws which were required to be faithfully executed were being resisted and failing in execution in nearly one third of the states. In other words, there was lawlessness in one third of the country. Must they be allowed to finally fail an execution, even if it had been perfectly clear that by the use of the means necessary to their execution, some single law made in such extreme tenderness of the civil liberty, citizens' liberties that practically it relieves more of the guilty than of the innocent should be very limited to be, ah, sorry, should to a very limited extent be violated, and I know that probably loses you. Okay, I'll explain. To state the question more directly, are all the laws but one to go unexecuted that the government itself should go to pieces lest the one be violated? Here's essentially what Lincoln's arguing. Now, they would have understood this. He said, look, here's the situation that was dealt to me. I came to be the president, nine states had already seceded from the union, and, and, I, and now a month into, the, into my gig here, I've got a real life shooting war on my hands and I have to act. What's different in April of 1861 that's not true for Lincoln in March of 1861? What's true for him? Does he have a crisis on his hands in March of 1861? not as big a one as he does when there's a real life shooting match. This is, the di this is Lincoln arguing for constitutionalizing prerogative. 
He's going to argue, and you'll see it again when he does with this thing with the Emancipation Proclamation, that times of crisis and necessity change the equation. That there are times during crisis and necessity that there are things outside the Constitution of his powers that are now constitutional. In ordinary civil times, Barack Obama cannot suspend the writ of habeas corpus. If he's presented with a similar type situation in the 21st century that Lincoln it was presented with, I suspect that Barack Obama would make this same argument. Look, these aren't ordinary civil times. And therefore, there are things that the president can do in ordinary civil times, I'm sorry, in times of crisis and necessity, that he couldn't do in these ordinary times. And they're lawful, says Lincoln, for him to do. If I had some board space, If you recall, we sort of had this little gig going, and I'm, I, maybe I've got a slide. This is the Lockean notion of prerogative, that sometimes a president needs to act, and he acts in such a way that he admits, hey, I, I didn't have no power to buy the Louisiana Territory. I know it's unlawful. Lincoln is arguing that in ordinary civil times, it may fall outside of his range of power, but these aren't ordinary civil times, and everything I've done, he says, is lawful based upon this. When you read Congress's little love note to him afterwards, they say, Abe, you're exactly right, and we view everything you've done as constitutional, and they sort of act like the Catholic Pope saying, we bless you, sir, and everything you've done is constitutional. We would have done the same thing if we'd have been around. So this was the legal argument made by Lincoln that everything he did was constitutional. Now he's speaking to a pretty sympathetic art, uh, audience. I mean, think about the Federal Congress. A couple months ago, it was full of Southerners. Now they're all gone and they're doing their own little Congress thing down in uh, Richmond, Virginia now. I mean, what a bizarro world. If you want to sort of, you know what bizarro world is? Like Superman and the alternate universe? Go to the Confederate White House. I may have mentioned this to you. In Richmond, Virginia, you can go to like the bizarro world. You know, today we can go to Washington and see where Barack Obama lives, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. In one time in our history, there was 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and the alternate White House in Richmond, Virginia, which is still there. In fact, when Lincoln, when Richmond finally fell in 1865, Lincoln got on a boat, sailed up the James River and went into Richmond, Virginia and sat in Jefferson Davis's chair, yeah, in the Confederate White House. And you too could go there and see Jefferson Davis's chair in the White House of the Confederate White House. It was just like, can you imagine, just bizarre world. Anyway, okay, so let's see, have we addressed any, well, and then he says more about, then he says more about secession, which is essentially what he said three months earlier in his inaugurals. It's just illegal. Okay, so do you get the sense of what Lincoln has done here? Now we come to the issue of slavery. So I said, I said that a way back here that we would be looking at um, uh, some big issues here. That's essentially what we've done so far. We've looked at Lincoln and the crisis of the Civil War. We've looked back to 1840 and we saw his views about executive initiation of hostilities and we see that he was consistent with it. You can see now that Lincoln is understanding the presidency in a Hamiltonian sense. Does that ring a bell now? It's the same way Barack Obama understands the presidency today. That view has won out, and particularly in times of crisis and necessity, we get a view of what the president thinks about executive power, and we got a chance to look at it with Lincoln. Now we get a chance to turn to this issue of slavery. So let me hearken you back to what Lincoln said in his first inaugural address. He said this, roughly, I've got no power to do anything about slavery where it exists. I am now the President of the United States, the 16th President of the United States, and I look at the Constitution and I have no power to ban slavery where it exists. And I have no inclination to do so. Um, why wouldn't this have made the Southerners happy? Shouldn't that have made the Southerners happy? And they just said, whew, 
man, we misread this guy. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. And you got a sense reading this week of why he would have been against it or why they would have thought he was against it because he was pretty clear on the issue. <laughs> right? But so, okay, but okay, so he's against slavery, but he's saying, look, I, I'm acting now as president and I'm not coming after your slaves. What do you know about U.S. history that would indicate that the Southerners would not have been particularly happy about this? Any ideas? Where's the boundaries of the, is Jonathan? Yep. So, so you know, if you recall, the, the 30 years prior to the Civil War, Henry Clay and others, if you're familiar with him as, a, as the great compromiser, had a series of compromises trying to keep the balance of power in Congress between slave states and free states, right? What's going to happen as the, as the country goes forward from the 1850s? What's happening in the country? Where's the borders of the country? Are they moving east? No, there's sort of this thing called the Atlantic Ocean sort of blocking us, right? Yeah? All right. They're moving west. We're going to get new states. Lincoln was a part of the Republican Party that was against the expansion of slavery. He, he was a part of a group of people who said, look, 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 we're not doing anything about slavery where it exists now, but I'm against its expansion. That's why the Southerners would not have been happy with this, because Lincoln is announcing that if there's going to be new states formed, none of them will be slave states. Now, to Jonathan's point about the balance of power, now it's going to be different. That's why this is not seen as conciliatory to the Southerners. This would not have made them happy. They, they would have read his song and dance from before, and, and that's what you got a chance to read here. So these compromises were meant to sort of keep the Civil War sort of tamped down, but it doesn't last very long. Lincoln starts to become a notable Republican in, in, in the late 1850s and starts to give a series of speeches in which he's becoming a big dog now in the Republican Party and someone who, who people think, well, maybe he might be a future president. So they start paying attention to what this guy's saying. And you got a chance to read a speech in 1858 where he's, he's uh, alluding to something that I think you're probably pretty familiar with called the House Divided Speech. Uh, what is he, why is this called the House Divided Speech? Come on, all you biblical scholars. I can see your George. You, any? No? Come on, you biblical scholars. Where is his house divided speech here? It's the Cooper Union. Ah, yes. Here we go. Come on, you biblical scholars. Think. Think. There's this. Ah, oh, here we go. The house divided itself cannot stand. Who? What obscure religious figure ever said something like that? Who? Thank you very much. So Mr. Lincoln may have been familiar with the Gospels, and he's alluding us to something here. So now I say to you, what was Jesus teaching? What's going on? What's Jesus being accused of here in the Gospels? And what's, what's sort of the, the back and forth here? Jesus cast, they say that Jesus is a devil himself casting yeah. out demons. Yeah. So Jesus is casting out demons, and, and the religious leaders come to him and say, you're doing this by the power of Satan. And Jesus' point was, no, 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 no. Uh, that would be like a house divided against itself, and, there's, and if, if there's no unity there, then it, then it collapses. Lincoln borrows that concept and says in 1858 that this country cannot be like a house divided because it will fall as well. And it's not going to fall. So how do you think Southerners, reading their, reading their uh, morning newspaper over their coffee or mint julep, 
would have, would have understood these words. He says here on page 25 of the um, House Divided Speech. <clears throat> Under the operation of that policy, that agitation has not only ceased, but it's constantly augmented. In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis has been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I don't expect the union to be dissolved. I do expect the house to fall. I do, I'm sorry, I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect that it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or the other. How do you think Southerners would have read that? If you're talking, man, who's this Abe Lincoln guy? Hey, did you see what he said in New York? You know? How do you think the Southerners would have looked at that verbiage? Put yourself in their place. What do you think? He's going to make them all increase. Yeah, they certainly would have viewed that, saying, look, this guy is not a compromiser. Henry Clay was a compromiser. This guy is not a compromiser. He's dangerous. If he ever becomes president, we're out of here. He became president in November 1860, and this would have been his track record, and they would have said, this guy's not conciliatory on slavery. So his words in the first inaugural address would have fallen on deaf ears because of this kind of stuff, right? That's why I had you sort of take a gander at, at this. Um, uh, that's, that last point's not particular. Um, Essentially, Lincoln in this speech in 1850 starts to, starts to take note of there's some key political figures in the United States, including the sitting president in 1858, and they're all Southerners, and he starts to wonder whether there's some kind of Southern conspiracy going on here, and a and little bit of a conspiracy thing, not, not particularly important for our purposes. Um, this speech that he gives here is a little more interesting. This is a speech that he gives, I think again in New York City. Uh, I think the Cooper Institute is in New York. Uh, yes. And, and he's giving a very uh, a notable speech here. And this is to Republicans. He's giving this speech and he's going to admonish Republicans to a certain regard. But for our purposes, he's starting to lay out things like this, where, where you start to say, look, what are my personal thoughts on slavery? I think it's evil, I mean, to say the least. He thinks that the founders and the Constitution meant to confine slavery to where it existed. And he's got a decent point about this. His point eludes us back to the fact that the Constitution itself was a compromise and that they actually said, look, we're not going to deal with this issue of slavery for 20 years. It's in the Constitution, where they've essentially said that the issue of slavery will not be addressed for 20 years. We're just not going to deal with it. So it's, it's just written into the Constitution that no change will be made vis-a-vis -vis this slavery question. And Lincoln and, and, and others made an argument that the, the founders wanted it contained. They didn't want it expanding and all this kind of thing. Um, he thinks, despite this famous court case, that the federal government can do something about slavery. The Dred Scott case was really the case that lit the fuse for the Civil War. So let's say that the country is just radically divided over this health care issue. I mean, I know it's a bit of a stretch, right, because people dislike it but it's not likely that people are thinking about taking up guns as a result of this. But let's just say they are. Let's say half of the country loves Obamacare, half hates it. And then the Supreme Court is going to weigh in this summer on what they think about Obamacare. And they rule that it's unconstitutional. And one half of the country says, all right, it's go time. We're going to war. That's what the Dred Scott case was sort of like. In the Dred Scott case, it was essentially the U.S. Supreme Court siding with the Southerners and saying that the federal government does not have the power to regulate slavery. It overruled the Missouri Compromise of 1820, declaring it unconstitutional, and saying that slavery is a state issue. Southerners, 
northerners, abolitionists said, this is, this, is a, this is now representing a permanent divide that needs to probably be settled by the <coughs> Civil War. So Dred Scott is the case that lit the fuse for the Civil War. And Lincoln, in a sense, draws his line in the sand. But I think the most interesting thing for us to see here, here is at the end of this speech. So if you've got it, uh, where he starts to address Republicans. Ah, yes. OK, you ready? A few words now. This is page 49, if you're following. And again, if, if, if you don't have this in front of you, I, I would encourage you to do it. Because as you're preparing for exams, it'd be, it'd be very nice for you to note what we took special cognizance of and, and that kind of thing. A few words now to Republicans. So he's, now he's speaking in-house. But, there, but, but, but the Southern Democrats would have read this, and these published uh, speeches would have been read down south. And again, ask yourself how Southerners would have read this. A few words now to Republicans. It is exceedingly desirable that all parts of this great Confederacy shall be at peace and in harmony with one another. Now, this is two years before Lincoln's president. Let us Republicans do our part to have it so. Even though much provoked, let us do nothing through passion and ill temper. Even though the Southern people will not so much as listen to us, let us calmly consider their demands and yield to them if in our deliberate view of our duty we possibly can. Judging by all they say and do, and by the subject and nature of the controversy with us, let us determine, if we can, what will satisfy them. So now he says, what will make these Southerners happy? Will they be satisfied if the territories, these new possible states, be unconditionally surrendered to them? So maybe that will make the Southerners happy. Maybe we will announce to the Southerners that any new states west of the Mississippi will automatically be slave states. Maybe that'll make them happy. We know that this won't. In all their present complaints against us, the territories are scarcely mentioned. Invasions and insurrections are all the rage now. Will it satisfy them if in the future we have nothing to do with invasions and insurrections? We know it will not. We so know because we know we never had anything to do with invasions and insurrections, and yet this total abstaining doesn't exempt us from their charge and denunciation. The question recurs then, what will satisfy them? And think about, think about a Southerner hearing these words. What will then satisfy these Southerners? Simply this, we must not only let them alone, but we must somehow convince them that we do let them alone. This we know by experience is no easy task. We've been so trying to convince them from the very beginning of our organization, the Republican Party, but with no success. In all our platforms and speeches, we've constantly protested our purpose to let them alone, but this has had no tendency to convince them. Uh, alike availing to convince them is the fact that they have never detected any of us, a man in any of us, in any attempt to disturb them. These natural and apparently inadequate means all failing, what will convince the Southerners that we're going to leave them alone? This and only this, cease to call slavery wrong and join them in calling it right. Wow. That's pretty bold, right? So he's saying the only things that will satisfy these Southerners is if we change our moral view on slavery and not only not fight them on it, but celebrate it with them. How do you think the Southerners would have viewed that? Do you think that would have ever been a serious proposition the Republicans ever would have considered? No. This guy's an agitator. I mean, you can just see the Southerners going, this guy's dangerous. Reading this stuff? All right. So he says, this and only this, call, cease to call slavery wrong and join the Southerners in calling it right. And this mean, must be done thoroughly in acts as well as words. Silence itself won't be tolerated. We must place ourselves avowedly with them Senator Douglas' new sedition law must be enacted in force, suppressing all declarations that slavery is wrong, made in politics, press, pulpits, and private. We must arrest and return fugitive slaves with greedy pleasure. We must pull down our free state constitutions. In other words, the only thing that'll make Southerners happy is if we make all of the states in the Union slave states and join them in this slavery proposition. That's the only thing that'll make Southerners happy.
Now that's a bit of a straw man argument. You know what a straw man argument is? Anybody have a clue what a straw man? In a certain sense, yes. I hearken you back to a 1930s classic with little Dorothy and Toto and they're strolling around a yellow brick road. That's my cue for you to tell me what movie I'm talking about. The Wizard of Oz. Who's the first person that Dorothy meets on the road to the castle? The straw man, the scarecrow. He's easy to rip apart, isn't he? I mean, you get in a fight with a scarecrow, you got a pretty easy fight on your hands. A straw man argument is where you intentionally take your opponent's argument to some weird extreme for the purpose of building up a very weak version of your opponent's argument so that it's easily torn down. The Southerners would have recognized this as a straw man argument and, and seen the, there was some, there was real feistiness to Lincoln. Don't, don't sort of miss that. I would have loved to seen him give this speech as well because there, he wouldn't have delivered it in some dry tone. It would have been feisty and there would have been a lot of yeahs in the audience and that kind of thing. So, so Lincoln is, is doing all this and saying, look, uh, uh, these Southerners are not going to be assuaged by any means here. This is a portent of if this guy ever gets president that things are going to go. That's why nine southern states secede. That's really what I'm trying to demonstrate to you here. Okay, now Lincoln is president. For the first two and a half years, the war goes by horribly. There are many people calling Lincoln to make this war about slavery and declare it so. He refrains from doing it. In my home state of Missouri, when Missouri was, in a sense, liberated, there was a lot of Southerners. In fact, uh, the, 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 there was more Southern soldiers in Missouri than Northern soldiers at the beginning. Eventually, Missouri is at the point of a gun kept in the Union. And the Union general in St. Louis declared that any slave in his area, Missouri, was now free. Lincoln countermanded that and said, no, 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 they are not free. Early in the war, everybody thought this war would be quick, ugly, but over quickly, right? I mean, just let's have a few nasty battles and, and one side's going to win. Once it became evident to everybody that this was going to be a long slog, it changes Lincoln's thoughts on slavery. And that's what you got a chance to sort of read on here. He issued an Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. That's two years into the war's effort. What does the Emancipation Proclamation do? Why is Lincoln famous for issuing the Eman That's an executive order. That's not, that's not something Congress did. This is something Abraham Lincoln did. What is the Emancipation Proclamation? Judging by your silence, I'm guessing that you would all agree with me about what it is. I think it was Lincoln saying that we should all get free in and out. That's what I think. <laughs> Somebody correct me. I don't want to walk out of here 20 minutes from now holding on to the view that Lincoln thought we should all get free in and out. Does anybody have any different view about what maybe what the Emancipation Proclamation was? I mean, here it is. It's not very long. It's, it's just one page. What's he doing in there? Is he mentioned in and out, or what, what's he doing with that? Be gutsy. Be gutsy. I've, I've revealed to you what I think about it, and I'm sensing that you might think I'm wrong about it, but who knows? Yeah, take a guess. Setting the slaves free. Now that seems to be a little more accurate than my thoughts about in and out. Um, but that's not entirely accurate. What is the 13th Amendment to the US Constitution? Does anybody have a guess? Uh, it made slavery illegal. So. So what's going on here? I mean, if I read the 13th Amendment, it says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude 
shall be uh, shall exist in the United States. I mean, that seems to cover the issue of slavery. We don't. We don't. We're not doing this anymore. Says the Thirteenth Amendment. That's not until 1865, I believe. Yeah, they passed that shortly after the Civil War. So, so that's not passed till 1860. Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. So Jennifer, why in the world would the US Congress need to do something that seemingly has already been done? Well, did the Emancipation Proclamation not include all of the states? Ah. So it, was only, it didn't include the borderlands. Something like that. All right. That's a very key point. This document does not globally free the slaves. That's what you probably walked into this class thinking, that the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves, sort of. Notice on this document, it lists geographically something, it, it, Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, except the parishes of St. Bernard, blah, 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 da, 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 Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, all right? So it's, it's listing some geography in the United States and says this order pertains only to certain geography within the United States. You will note that Missouri is not on this list. Kentucky is not on the list. Maryland is not on the list. These are all slave states. The Emancipation Proclamation did not apply to those territories, states. Why do you think? So if you're a slave in Missouri, this has no application for you. This has application for you, well, let's just take one here. Um, Alabama. If you're a slave in Alabama as of July, or January 1st, 1863, technically and legally, you are being held illegally now. You're, you're, you're still a slave but now you're being held illegally because this has the force of law, an executive order. So what do you think that does for a slave in Alabama on January 1st, 1863? Nothing, right? I mean, it's not like your master read in the paper, oh, golly, day, Lincoln issued an Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, you're free to go. I mean, it wasn't like that. Why do you think, why do you think Lincoln would issue such an order? Do you, do you well, if the slaves were valid, they never did. Okay, so. Okay. Yeah, so it might incite psychologically when slaves got wind of this in areas that, like Alabama, it might incite them to rebel. Okay, what do, you, what do you think is true about all these areas that are mentioned here in January of 1863? Well, I was gonna say Please. I was just going to say that um, the Emancipation Proclamation like, left room for the 13th Amendment because if you just went from nothing to the 13th Amendment, that's a really big step, but because mm -hmm. of the Emancipation Proclamation, like, it kind of like fetched its way. So maybe this is part of a gradual effort. Yeah. Mm, maybe. Uh, this was pretty controversial in, in, in the northern, many northerners were upset with this. Many northern troops, many northern generals were upset about this because they would say things as, as offensive as, that's not what I'm fighting for. I'm not fighting for these Negroes. I'm fighting for the Union. And, and Lincoln had some problems within the Union military ranks after he did this because many of those folks were not big fans of African Americans. So he had some own, pro own problems with this. Essentially, here's what he's doing. Lincoln is freeing, legally, with this document, slaves that were still behind Confederate lines. By January of 1863, Union forces had conquered parts of the South. There were unconquered parts of the South, and that's what that paragraph has listed within it. These were unconquered parts of the South. So uh, one of the reasons Lincoln may want to free the slaves in those areas is because he might want to incite some kind of rebelliousness amongst the slaves. Fair enough. 
But why else do you think Lincoln would want to free slaves behind southern lines and not in places like Missouri or Kentucky or Maryland or places like that? Put your thinking caps on and think about that. Why would Lincoln want to free slaves behind southern lines and that only? What is Lincoln doing in January of 1863 in general? What's he doing? He's campaigning now? Yeah? Would it be like show his power? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, I mean, he would see himself as the executive of the whole country despite large parts of it being an open rebellion. There's something bigger. What's going on in January of 1863 that's been going on for a couple years? A civil war, thank you, right? You've got now a long, drawn-out civil war. What would those slaves be doing behind southern war lines? Maybe not fighting. It wasn't, the southerners would not have been apt to give their slaves guns. But just think on a practical level. What are, what are these slaves doing behind southern lines? What? Working in what capacity? Uh, supplying food, right? Supply, so they would be part of a food effort and you need to feed a southern army. What else would they have been doing for the southern army? Well, are you trying to say that since there are slaves there, if they, because this, they can go to the north and then it'll change the population and like, give them an advantage? This is a military issue. This is a military issue. Yeah. So if you take out their supply, then they don't you not, You're taking out their labor force. There was estimates that there was 150,000 slaves that were active in southern war efforts, digging trenches, hauling supplies, you know, being active in, in farms that would be supplying southern troops with, with this, with, with food and these kinds of things. This is a war measure. This is Lincoln acting as a commander in chief during an active time of war, doing something that would otherwise be outside his constitutional authority, and now it's in his constitutional authority. That's the letters that we're now turned to where he, where he wrote to this guy in Kentucky, Herndon. I'm sorry, what's his name? Uh, Hodges, sorry, Hodges, too many H's. So if you're looking at the letter from Hodges that I have you read, he says this. This is the April 4th letter. I'm naturally anti-slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I can't remember when I didn't think or feel this way. And yet I've never understood that the president conferred upon me an unrestricted right to act officially upon this judgment and feeling. He took an oath and blah, blah, blah. I understood too, down the page, that in ordinary civil administration, the oath forbade me to practically indulge my primary abstract judgment on the moral question of slavery. And then he goes forward and saying, look, in ordinary civil times, the president can't do anything about slavery. I have no power. He announced that in his first inaugural address. But now times have changed down the page. He says, I felt that measures otherwise unconstitutional might become lawful by becoming indispensable for the preservation of the Constitution. We have a war going on in which we're fighting for the very survival of the country, and I felt that measures otherwise unconstitutional now became constitutional. Yes? Oh, yes. So, so essentially what Lincoln is arguing here is for a Hamiltonian use of prerogative and this document that you see right here is, a, is an example of something that a president did during wartime, crisis and necessity that he otherwise would have been unconstitutional or unlawful for him to do that now became lawful. That's what the Emancipation Proclamation is. It's a president now as commander-in-chief during active military operations doing something different. 
here's something else a president did during active military conflict that was questionable in a constitutional basis, but the U.S. Supreme Court said was constitutional. Franklin Delano Roosevelt took Japanese American citizens out of their homes over yonder on the coast here and said, you folks shall now be residing in the middle of the desert. That is a wartime measure that a president took, akin to this, right? Now, the 13th Amendment comes along right after the Civil War and frees slaves globally. So if you were a slave in Missouri or Kentucky or someplace that the Union forces had already liberated in a sense, you were still a slave until the 14th, 13th Amendment was passed. That's roughly the pecking order here. So here's what you learned, right? And we're going to break now to talk with our groups. What you learned is that Lincoln's issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation was limited only to a certain part of the slave population. It was done as a war measure, affecting only a certain uh, part of the South, notably where slaves were helping the Southern war effort. You're still a slave if you're not included in this area where he mentions until the 13th Amendment. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.